Mars uh, discovery. And so uh, you could actually watch the announcement live. That was kind of new, that uh, you know, everybody around the world could watch uh, the NASA announcement live of this amazing discovery they've made on Mars. And these are the two most critical quotes about the discovery, at least in my opinion. They had two astronomers there uh, who were part of the study. And uh, you know, one, uh, Jennifer, she said, we found organic molecules and rocks from an ancient lake bed. And her uh, peer joined in and said, keep in mind, organic compounds are fundamental to our search for life. So that's how it was put out there. And uh, you know, the problem is when you use terms like organic compounds that are fundamental uh, for life, lay people think <coughs> DNA, RNA, proteins. Or if not that, they're thinking amino acids, the bioactive amino acids, the nucleobases, the ribose sugars. They didn't find any of that. And uh, you know, I've written an article about this. It's actually up on our, uh, my Facebook page. I wrote it right after the discovery because uh, people in my office says, hey, they announced the discovery. You've you got to get an article. You've got to get it out today. Well, I literally did get it out. Although my policy is I don't throw out an article until the peer-reviewed papers appear. And those peer-reviewed papers didn't come out until uh, Friday morning. So I put my article up on Friday afternoon because I didn't want to just read the NASA announcement and all the web uh, noise is going on, but actually see the peer-reviewed articles. And in the article that I released on Friday, I give you links uh, to the NASA announcement, the video announcement that you can watch, also gave you links to the two research papers that are the basis uh, for uh, this announcement. But here's the problem for a lay audience. Lay people think organics are things like DNA, RNA, and proteins, or at least amino acids and nucleobases. The scientific definition of an organic is a hydrocarbon. Any molecule that's got hydrogen in it and carbon in it, we call that organic. And the one that they got all excited about is they found methane. Well, methane is CH4. It's one of the simplest hydrocarbon molecules that are out there. Now they said, well, why was all this buzz? Well, it's because here on Earth, most of the methane that we have here on Earth uh, comes from a biological source. Uh, that's because our planet is filled with methanogens. Say, so what are those? Those are bacteria that expel methane to the atmosphere. In fact, there's a lot of those bacteria inside our digestive tract. And so we expel a lot of, all animals expel uh, methane. I won't go any farther than that. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of jokes about what was happening to little green men on Mars a while ago, but. <laughs> but, and, the other thing is, people got the idea that this is the first time that uh, they had seen methane on Mars. It's not. Uh, we've been seeing methane on Mars. Uh, well, we, I mean the rovers, uh, particularly the Curiosity rover. They've been seeing it uh, for four and a half years. So this is not the first discovery of methane. Um, that was seen a long time ago. However, what was brand new it's the first time they saw methane on Mars uh, from a core drill uh, into uh, the crust of uh, Mars. And the thing that, for Curiosity, I'm going to show you some photos uh, of what Curiosities look like. But for 18 months, its drill device has been out of commission. And you know, one of the most amazing stories, and you know, a lot of you guys uh, work here at JPL, hats off to you because Curiosity had a major repair issue and they were able to repair it from here. You know, that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. Here's this drill device that's been out of commission for 18 months and they were able to repair that device uh, without actually going to Mars and trying to fix it. They did it all from here. And uh, literally uh, just weeks ago, uh, that uh, drill got back in operation. And so they had, uh, curiosity, go to a little place, drill through the rock, and pull a specimen out, and they found methane uh, in that, which tells them 
there's underground methane. And, uh, and of course, I mean, if the, that methane is there, maybe life is responsible for the methane. So that's kind of what they're thinking. Hey, methanogens, that's where most of the methane here comes from Earth. Now, NASA in their announcement was conservative in saying, we're not claiming this methane is a signature of life. It's a possible signature of life. Uh, but what got them excited is the, for decades, uh, geophysicists have been aware there is an abiotic source of methane here on Earth. That abiotic source is uh, volcanoes. Um, so whenever there's a volcano, uh, a lot of them will emit a lot of methane. And so that's been kind of textbook geophysics for the past several decades is there's two sources of methane uh, in Earth's atmosphere from life and then uh, from uh, volcanic activity. But it is well known that Mars has been volcanically dormant uh, for at least the last billion years and perhaps even the last three or three and a half billion years. So it says this can't come from volcanic activity, it must come from life. Okay. What is new, and this has only been around for the last couple of years, is geophysicists have found another abiotic source of methane here on Earth. And uh, that is what's called a water-gas-rock mixture. If you've got underground uh, liquid water coming into contact with rock and pockets of gas, that will make methane. And until about a few weeks ago, it was presumed that that process could only make a tiny amount of methane. Uh, in the article I posted, I give you a link to a research paper basically making the point, we now know that here on Earth, the water, rock, gas mixture makes a lot of methane. Not just a tiny amount of methane, but makes a lot of methane and makes it all the time whether or not uh, there's volcanic activity going on. Well, could this work on Mars? I'll get to that, but let me show you some pretty pictures first, okay? Uh, this is, uh, well, it looks a lot better on my computer than up on the screen. <laughs> uh, but this is a photo of Mars uh, taken uh, with the, uh, yeah, and it's from Earth. So that, that's, that's one of the highest resolution photographs of uh, Mars uh, from Earth. This is from space, and this is the Osiris uh, mission. And so that's a fairly high resolution. And yeah, the color's distorted. It really does look red, uh, not that color. And uh, you can see the polar caps and how small the polar caps are. I mean, it's basically spacecraft that have gone to Mars that uh, have revealed to us that the polar ice caps on Mars are very, very thin. And it is such we now realize why they're so thin. Because the rotation axis of Mars flips over like this by about 60 degrees on time scales of tens of millions of years. And what happens is when it flips over like that, that ice at the pole now becomes exposed <coughs> to warmer temperatures. Uh, because it's closer uh, to the new uh, equator. And uh, what that does, it melts away the polar cap. And uh, I shouldn't use the word melt, because on Mars, the melting point of water is identical to the uh, uh, boiling point. So, I mean, if you've ever been up in the mountains, you realize that when you boil water up in the mountains, it boils like at 160 degrees, not 212. That's because you've got a thinner atmosphere. While the Martian atmosphere is so thin uh, that the boiling point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the same temperature as the freezing point, which is when you get ice and you expose it to heat, the ice basically evaporates. Is that exact? Pardon me? Is that exact? Well, it is possible if you've got a liquid drop of water on Mars, it'll stay liquid for a maximum of two seconds. So, yeah, but what I mean is, it's 32 degrees uh, where the boiling point is and the freezing point is. Yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's right on 32. So, 
Uh, it's kind of like dry ice. You don't see dry ice in liquid form. That's because the boiling point and the freezing point uh, are the same. Well, that explains why you don't have uh, liquid water on the surface of Mars. Okay, anyway, these are actually some selfies. Believe it or not, they set up curiosity to be able to take selfies. <laughs> so these are not artistic renditions, they're actual photographs. And so this is looking back uh, from curiosity across the Martian landscape. And once again, the true color is kind of a reddish orange, not what you see there. But you can see the tracks that were made. And this is looking forward on uh, the surface of Mars. And as you can see, it's all rock and dust. There, there really is nothing else. But here's something that was quite exciting. Uh, I don't know why NASA didn't make a big deal about this, because uh, what you see here is a discovery by Curiosity of uh, a meteorite. That's not Martian material. That little rock you see there, that's actually something that came from outer space. And they know that because of how different its composition is. It's basically one of those uh, nickel, iron, uh, cobalt uh, meteorites. And incidentally, there's a lot of Earth meteorites on Mars. They haven't found any yet, but uh, if they keep looking, they're going to find them. After all, we've got 22 Martian meteorites here on Earth. And you're going to have a whole lot more Earth meteorites uh, on the surface of Mars. Uh, this shows a curiosity uh, climbing uh, something called the Vera Rubin uh, Mound, or Mountain. And Vera Rubin is a famous astronomer. And uh, so here it is on top. And this one actually is um, uh, not done on Mars, uh, but done uh, in a lab here on Earth. Basically, this is a shot showing uh, what Curiosity did in order to get the drill. It basically went up to a rock slope like this, and over towards the right, you can see the drilling device, and it went into the rock and drilled several inches into the rock, pulled out a sample, and they found uh, methane there. Now, as I mentioned, uh, water in a frozen form on the surface of Mars <coughs> won't melt, it evaporates. And if it's at the pole, it's cold enough that it won't evaporate. However, as I already mentioned, the pole is not stable, and when it tilts over, the rotation axis tilts over, uh, it gets exposed to warm enough temperatures that the ice evaporates, but that means you've got a new pole and a new ice forms. So where does that ice come from? Comets. Uh, so comets keep replacing the uh, polar ice caps that keep disappearing. So it's kind of a cycle of ice cap disillusion and reformation uh, thanks to comets coming on the moon. And for what it's worth, there's actually a tiny ice cap on our moon. At the south pole of our moon, there's an ice cap. Not very big, it's basically inside a crater uh, where the walls of the crater are so high that sunlight never reaches the crater floor. And cometary delivery has caused a nice thick layer of ice to form there. Sufficiently thick that there's actually plans put out by a number of nations to actually have, no, not a hockey rink. <laughs> <coughs> I can't imagine trying to play hockey with those 250 pound things on your back, but uh, that could be interesting. Uh, but no, the whole idea is that would be a great place to set up uh, a colony on the moon because you can tap into the water. And uh, that gives you water to drink. You could break the water up and that would give you oxygen to breathe, and the hydrogen would give you fuel that uh, you could burn. So uh, even our moon has a pole, and that's simply because of cometary uh, delivery. Now, as I wrote in my article in this, I think we already have really good evidence that this is not biotic methane. And that's because this is an effective place for the water, gas, um, water, gas, uh, rock reaction to work. Because we know that there's ice below the surface of a Mars that's been discovered before. And uh, you know, if it's below the surface and even when it's near the equator, uh, the rock layer above it is sufficient to keep it cold enough that it stays in frozen form. 
Now also this thing just drilled a little way into the rock, which means that you're probably at a place where occasionally uh, the surface of the rock is warm enough that it actually melts the water below. And because it's not exposed to the atmosphere, you actually get the frozen water going into liquid form, albeit in very tiny amounts. But a tiny little bit of water uh, will work with the rock and the gas there to release methane. Now I think what confirms this is there are two papers published in Science about this discovery. One paper was how they found the methane in this drill, but the other one was basically looking at the atmospheric methane over the past four and a half years. Now keep in mind, uh, Mars has a much longer year than we have, so four and a half years of our time is a little less than three years of Martian time. But it's long enough that they were able to test whether or not there was a seasonal variation in the atmospheric methane, and indeed there was. More methane is released in Martian summer than in the Martian winter, which I think is strong evidence that the methane indeed is from a water, rock, gas mixture below the surface of Mars. Because you would expect the surface uh, to be warmer, which means you're going to get more of the ice below uh, melting into liquid form, which is going to cause more methane to react. Whereas in the winter time, uh, you're going to have a higher probability that the surface will be so cold that the frozen water below the surface will remain frozen. Not much of it is going to go in the liquid form. And they can actually see a nice sinusoidal signal of the car of methane release going up and then going down completely in sync with the summer winter cycle of Mars. So, and incidentally, we already know you can't have life on Mars because of the known conditions of Mars. Um, Mars has a very thin atmosphere and no magnetic field. What does that mean? You're going to get ultraviolet radiation at short wavelengths coming in from the sun and bathing uh, the surface of Mars. Although some NASA astronomers pointed out, well, that would certainly rule out life on the surface, but what about life a few uh, inches uh, below? Well, even a few inches below, you're going to get significant uh, radiation exposure because also the cosmic rays are going to be coming in uh, unimpeded. And just like the origin of life from a naturalistic perspective is not possible on Earth, it's even less likely on Mars because of something known as the oxygen ultraviolet paradox. If you got oxygen in the environment, that oxygen stops prebiotic chemistry. It stops the formation of the amino acids and the nucleobases and the sugars uh, that you need, and it stops the assembly of amino acids into proteins. But if you don't have any oxygen, there's nothing to stop the ultraviolet radiation coming in from the sun, and ultraviolet radiation is just as catastrophic uh, to origin of life uh, biochemistry as the ultraviolet radiation is, which is why they call this the oxygen ultraviolet paradox. If you got oxygen, that stops prebiotic chemistry. If you don't have oxygen, that stops prebiotic chemistry. Because the only way to block out the ultraviolet radiation is with an ozone shield. And the only way you can get an ozone shield is if you've got oxygen. And so that's why in all these laboratory experiments, where they're trying to uh, you know, use a flask experiment to assemble amino acids, they make sure no ultraviolet radiation and no oxygen, which is why we've written on our book on the origin of life, the Uri Miller experiments are irrelevant to the origin of life because we know those conditions are not possible on Earth and they're certainly not possible on Mars either. However, I close my article out uh, by restating a prediction I made in the 1980s. It was interesting, when I put this up on my Facebook page, a number of people said, yeah, I actually remember you saying that in the 1980s. So I actually got some people that can document that I really did say that back in the 1980s. And what I said back in the 1980s was that if NASA or other space agencies look hard enough for the remains of life on Mars, they will find those remains. For the simple reason, that there's a calculated 200 kilograms of Earth's soil on every 100 square kilometers of the Martian surface.
just like that little meter right I showed you. Uh, every time a sufficiently large meteoroid strikes the Earth, it causes Earth's soil to be exported throughout the solar system. And that Earth's soil falls on the, all the different planets and moons of our solar system. And because Earth has been so prolific with life, and because it's been bombarded for such a long period of time, uh, literally throughout the entire history of life here on planet Earth of 3.8 billion years, we know there's going to be 200 kilograms of Earth material in every 100 square kilometers. And when I put in my Facebook article, uh, there is 20 quadrillion microbes in every ton of Earth soil. Take, pardon me, take those 200 kilograms, 200 kilograms of uh, Earth soil contains 20 quadrillion microbes. Now, because of the trajectory between here and Mars and the exposure to radiation from cosmic rays in the sun during that trajectory, I believe we're talking the remains of Earth life. There's actually a very, very, very tiny possibility that an Earth microbe could get to Mars and still remain viable. There's a couple of bacteria that exist on the face of the Earth that can withstand extreme radiation and desiccation and vacuum conditions. Yes? Do the methane that they found dissipate over time? In other words, if this was the result of life, how long ago could it have been? Well, that's one reason they got excited, because we do know, just like here on Earth, methane in the atmosphere doesn't stick around. Uh, Mars has way too low of a gravitational pull to keep methane. And sunlight will break the methane down. And so it escapes to outer space just like it does here on Earth. That explains why, for example, Jupiter has so much methane or why Pluto has so much methane. Pluto, even though it's small, has got lots of methane because it's so incredibly cold. Uh, so cold that the methane uh, remains uh, in frozen form. <clears throat> Jupiter keeps a lot of methane because its gravity is so strong. But both Earth and Mars are too warm for the gravitational pull too small uh, to hang on to methane. Incidentally, make the Earth just slightly more massive, we would keep methane. But our mass is just low enough that that, that doesn't happen. And so, you know, people are worried about methane as a greenhouse gas. <laughs> hey, unlike carbon dioxide, if you wait long enough, it escapes to outer space. And so it gets away. So that's why they're saying this methane has to come from a current source. And that's why I'm making the point. I think it's this water, gas, um, rock reaction that's responsible for the release of methane. Uh, but yeah, there are NASA scientists saying, well, maybe there's methanogens there that are pumping out the, the methane. And so they're gearing up to spend more of your tax dollars uh, to look for that. However, I close my article off by basically making a point if NASA looks hard enough, they will find the remains of life on Mars, but that what they're going to find is the remains of Earth life. It's not going to be Martian life, it'll be the remains of Earth life. But I also close the article off by saying if they want to find the remains of Earth life on an extraterrestrial body, it's far cheaper and easier to find it on the Moon than it is to find it on Mars. Because the moon's got a hundred times as much
no life on Mars, and then we find life on Mars. And either way, it's an exciting discovery. And I wound up closing my article off by saying, you know what? We Christians can easily get the reputation of being naysayers. You know, look at how, you know, they keep spending our money and they keep coming up with nothing. Uh, they're not coming up with nothing. I think the biggest, in fact, when I spoke at NASA Houston, in fact, when I spoke at JPL, I made the same comment, that in terms of getting the public behind uh, interplanetary space exploration, I think we'd be, be smarter uh, really promoting the geophysical benefits of this exploration. So the fact that Curiosity can drill into the rocks, and I'd be excited about sending a mission to Mars where they can do a deep drill, is that will tell you a lot about the geochemical uh, physical history of the interior of Mars. That's an exciting thing to explore. Moreover, I think that if we can learn more about Venus and Mars and the moon uh, through core drills, that's going to tell us a lot about our planet Earth. And what's special about the interior geophysics of the Earth, I think we're going to discover a lot of design evidence that makes our planet habitable for humans uh, thanks to these uh, explorations of Mars and Venus and the moon. And it's going to take core drills to be able to pull that off. So I think this is step one to that whole discovery. So it says, you know, Forget about the life issue. Let's really focus on finding out about the amazing geophysics of the different planets and moons of our solar system and what's so special about our planet Earth. And frankly, I think the U.S. taxpayer could get really excited about that. And so, because I know NASA's worried how much longer can they count on the generosity of the U.S. taxpayer. And my advice uh, when I get to speak there is saying, well, why don't you advertise things where you're likely to be highly successful? I mean, if you never find life on Mars, eventually the taxpayer is going to, uh, you know, uh, give up on you. But if you promote something where you can actually deliver, I think you can get somewhere. We got a JPL engineer here. Yeah, what we'll, we'll uh, comment from here? Doing exactly that. The yeah. Insight mission is on its way to Mars right now. Jeff Almond, whose wife is the third, that's that's his mission. And it's All right. a geophysical mission where they are drilling deep. And they're going to be detecting Earth or Mars quakes with just one seismometer. They'll be able to determine where they're from and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's pretty remarkable. So, yeah, that's good news. And you know, thanks to all you guys here at JPL, I think you're the ones that are really focused on trying to get the science out of these missions. So, uh, I always have a difficult time when I'm at NASA Houston because they want to send people to these places. It's like, hey, once you're at Mars or farther away than Mars, it becomes exponentially cheaper to send machines and to send people. And you don't kill anybody when you send machines. Uh, it might take a little longer because, you know, obviously humans are more adaptable and can do things on the fly. Uh, but hey, if you discover that you made a mistake on a presupposition with one mission, you can always send another one. So, and that's kind of what JPL does. They, they send these spacecraft out, and based on what they discover, they design ones that are appropriate for the discoveries. And yeah, hey, it takes a little bit longer, but I think you get more secure results. And boy, does it really save you a lot of money. I mean, when I spoke at NASA Houston, it says, you know, if you guys actually work out the money in terms of trying to get a human to Mars and back without killing them, you could easily send 10,000 unmanned missions to Mars for less money. And will a human mission actually learn more about the science of Mars than 10,000 unmanned missions? And I think Curiosity basically is a no-brainer. Look what it's been able to achieve. And hey, it was only a billion dollars. Uh, I don't know, was it 1.1 billion? I forget the exact number, but yeah. A little bit more? Okay. <laughs> but still. Yeah, in the back. Sorry. Um, kind of cut to the chase to the bottom line here, theologically speaking. If they do um, find strong evidence of life elsewhere, that doesn't conflict with any scripture either was found. Um, would you agree with that? Well, I would agree with that. And I'd also say finding life on Mars or the moon basically confirms that 
God has put so much life on earth with such great diversity for such a long period of time, it's simply inevitable that the remains of that earth life has been deposited on all the solar system bodies. Well, that's true as well. There's nothing in the Bible that says that God couldn't have created life elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's a major theological debate that's going on. And it's actually going on the hallways of reasons to believe because we've got different people with different opinions. And basically, the theological debate splits down into two compartments. One, you read the Bible. And even when you look at Psalm 104, God packing the earth with as much life as possible, as diverse as possible, as long as possible. And you look at all the life here on planet Earth today, eight and a half million eukaryotic species exist on the Earth. It kind of gives you the idea that God really enjoys creating. Uh, in fact, one theologian put it this way, it looks like God is a compulsive creator. <laughs> and he says, moreover, he made us humans and we humans are compulsive creators. And we're declared to be created in the image of God. And therefore they said, that being the case, God's not going to stop on one planet. He's going to have created life all kinds of places. But you know, it's going to be by God's miraculous hand. In fact, uh, one astrophysicist I talked to said, I'm really excited about trying to find life on another planet, because that means God performed two sets of miracles, not just one set of miracles. And wouldn't that be great for the Christian faith if we could actually uh, promote that message? That's one theological camp. The other theological camp says, when you look at especially the New Testament Gospels, notice how resistant Jesus was on a number of occasions to perform miracles, where he basically refused to perform a miracle. And notice, when you especially look at the Gospel of John, it seems like God constrains his miraculous interventions to just that which fulfills the spiritual purpose. And so those theologians are basically saying, does God need to do it on another planet to fulfill his stated spiritual purpose for creating? And their answer is, I don't think so. In which case they argue, this is the only place that God has created physical life in the universe. On the other hand, they would argue the remains of that earth life will be on the solar system bodies but not elsewhere. While meteors can take Earth life from the Earth and deposit on the different solar system bodies, it's not going to be able to take it all the way out uh, to say 10 light years away from us. Uh, with that kind of travel distance, the Earth life will be so broken down as to be unrecognizable by any current technology. And so. Now what theologians point out is there really aren't any biblical constraints that are explicit. The constraints you have is whether or not you think God conserves his miracles to fulfill his stated spiritual purpose or whether he so enjoys creating he's just going to create an abundance uh, everywhere uh, throughout the universe. Uh, but there's no explicit biblical constraint in either one. The only biblical constraint I'm aware of is what you see in Hebrews uh, 9 and 10, uh, maybe a little, yeah, 9 and 10, basically making the point that the creator of the universe came to one planet, died one time, one place for all. And so a lot of theologians make the point that seems to imply that we humans are the only life form in the universe that is spiritual and in need of redemption. Uh, but they said that doesn't rule out God making dolphins on another planet. They don't need redemption, so they're not spiritual. And some theologians even argue maybe it's possible that Christ's death on the cross was sufficient not only to redeem all humanity who so desires, maybe it extends beyond our planet. And so they've been arguing maybe that they had the broadcast uh, capability to see the uh, death of Christ on the cross through some kind of technology, but now we're getting kind of speculative. So, but here's the whole point. <clears throat> Many years ago, I commissioned an article on this very t uh, question. And I had three astronomers 
uh, combined to write the article. And the three of us ahead of time had different opinions and perspectives on this. And so you got to see three Christian astronomers uh, come up with, you know, here are the varieties of interpretation that are available to the Christian. But we concluded the article by saying, if you're an atheist, someone who believes that God was not responsible for life on earth or anywhere in the universe, you've only got one option. Your only option is the origin of life is such an easy step scientifically that it's everywhere. And we're gonna find life everywhere. So the Christians got options, the non-theist does not have options. Yes? When the Bible says the devil is the prince of the air, I wonder what's that air? Is it just our atmosphere? Or what about the evil UFOs where it's coming? Sure. <coughs> what do you think? Okay, all my comments are relative to physical life that's constrained to the universe. The Bible is clear that God has made at least one other species of intelligent life. He's made human beings, he's also made angels. But the angels are different. They're not constrained by the physics of this universe. They can live beyond the space-time dimensions of the universe. Uh, what's distinct about them, they can come into our <laughs> realm and leave our realm. We can't. We can't go into their realm. We're constrained to just the physical universe. So when I'm talking about, you know, did God create life elsewhere in the universe? I'm purposely limiting it to physical life that's constrained by the physics of the universe like we are. But yeah, there's these angels. And when it talks about these angels uh, being able to come into the air, it's basically making the point that they can come into our dimensional realm. And so I think we need to look at that term air as much more broadly than just the atmosphere. What's interesting about angels, they can come into our realm and they can briefly manifest themselves in any physical form they want. So they can come uh, as your dead grandfather. They can come as a UFO. They can come as a leprechaun. Uh, they can come as an animal. Uh, they can take whatever physical form they want, but it's always temporary. And interesting, you'll see in the pages of the Bible that sometimes angels uh, come into our realm and they're actually able to participate in physical activity. So for example, we've got Abraham feeding food to angels. They're able to eat food. Uh, but they don't need to eat food to maintain their physical sustenance. Incidentally, I think that's the way it's gonna be for us in the new creation. You'll be able to eat, but you don't have to eat. Eating will be an option, whereas right now, eating is not an option. Uh, we have to eat. And, uh, and likewise, you know, I, whether it's going to impact you physically or not, probably not. Because that definitely doesn't have any impact on the angels. Same thing goes about the oxygen. Uh, we need oxygen to breathe. The angels are okay breathing that oxygen, but they don't need it. So, because they have powers beyond ours. Are there calories in heaven? Are there calories in heaven? <laughs> well, you can enjoy food. Uh, but you don't need the food. And there's not enough scripture in the Bible that tells us what happens to that food that we eat at the marriage feast of the Lamb. Uh, you know, people are asking me questions. What, the, what is the digestive tract like? I says, that's not revealed in scripture. I don't know. So, uh, but it will be an option. And the whole point is, there's something that happens when spiritual beings get together and they eat and drink together. Notice how there's kind of a, uh, a fellowship union that takes place when we do that. And we're basically told that's not going to go away when we enter into the new creation. We're going to have these times of celebration and intimate fellowship as uh, we eat and drink together. There's a question here, yes. Um, I've heard other pastors talk about air meaning communication, the air waves. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, that could be too. I mean, uh, I think we need to look at that term very broadly. How broadly, I don't know. I mean, again, you're trying to base an entire theological uh, you know, book on a, one word, so hard to do. But we, do, we know from experiences that we've had with angels and with demons the kinds of powers they have. 
what they can do. And incidentally, we're told in Scripture that these angelic um, interactions uh, that we have here are a lot more common than we think. As it says in Hebrews 13 too, many of you have entertained angels unawares. I mean, there's all kinds of stories where people are in really deep trouble and suddenly this man or woman shows up, help them out, and two minutes later they're gone. They just disappear. So, but we think it's just some you know, good Samaritan that came along. Well, that good Samaritan was an angelic being. That happens. And we see examples of that in the book of Acts uh, where we see uh, the apostles being rescued uh, by angels. Yes? If this is derailing your subject, you don't need to... Oh, everybody derails me, so don't worry <laughs> about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. when, when it says in the Bible, Christ did a public display of his victory over principalities, this, this, this. The public, I wonder if it's our public as journalists or, or, or the public all over the <coughs> departed also and angels. Well, notice what we see in the Gospels. Jesus does two things. He demonstrates through his miracles that he's someone much greater than any of the Old Testament prophets. And these Old Testament prophets did amazing things, including raising people from the dead. But Jesus actually raised somebody from the dead who had been dead for four days. He also performed miracles that were far greater than anything that the demons could perform. So he basically was putting on public display, I am one who is more powerful than any of these angels that you fear. Because so much of the world worships demons. And you know, I've been to places like that in the world. And people are kind of in the grip thing, you know, what can we do with this power that we're under the influence of? Well, that's often when you see, and you see this in the book of Acts as well, where the demons are active, God's angels come through, and God comes through to show, hey, there's someone here that is greater than the things that you fear. Don't fear the demons. God is more powerful. His angels are more powerful than the demons. After all, only one-third of the angels rebelled. So the demons are outnumbered two to one just based on the angels. And then you've got God coming in as an ally. So, but often you'll see this in missionary annals that when they go to places of the world where the people are under powerful demonic oppression, God comes through and basically shows the people there is one more powerful. And therefore you don't need to fear this. And this is often how people come to faith in Christ. People say, well, why doesn't that happen here? The demons aren't as active as here. And therefore, if people aren't under that kind of influence, you know, God's got other ways of showing you, hey, this is stuff that's true. Basically, people need two things. They need to see that God is powerful. They need to see that God is true. And so where it's not a power issue, truth now becomes the big factor that you need to display. But I've been in places of the world where the demonic activity is very strong. In fact, the book I got coming out in September tells a story of when I was speaking in the Soviet Union when it's still being run by the communists and how one audience I addressed of uh, philosophers and physicists, at least 25% of those in the audience were demon possessed. And uh, I could tell because here's one sign of a demon. They will scream and yell and try to stop you from speaking, but in the screaming and yelling, they're accusing Jesus of committing vile moral crimes. Now, I've heard people take the Lord's name in vain who are not demon possessed. I mean, just go down to the, uh, the ports. Uh, you'll, you'll listen to people uh, throwing out the Lord's name in vain a lot. Uh, or I've heard this with people who are picking up trash. Anyway, that's another issue. But notice their restraint. They don't accuse Jesus of being a serial uh, homosexual rapist and murderer. They don't do that. But uh, demon-possessed people do. They accuse Jesus of horrible uh, moral crimes. And uh, they do it repeatedly. And uh, you know, the first time I spoke at this one place in uh, Russia, this, the demons, through these humans there, they were demon-possessed, were yelling and screaming so loudly and accusing 
us Christians and Jesus of these horrible uh, moral crimes that I couldn't give my message. I basically went straight to Q&A. But the next time I spoke to them, I took a Christian with me. And I said, I want you at the back, and I want you to pray throughout the whole time that the demons be quiet. And you know what happened? That's exactly what happened. Not a peep out of all those demon-possessed folks. The rest of the audience realized there's a greater power here. And I had their attention. And a lot of them came to Christ. So, again, it doesn't happen that frequently here, but that was a time in the Soviet Union when the Soviet government was trying to get a military edge on America by funding occult physics. You know, that went into the different universities. They actually had a department of occult physics. Incidentally, I knew a physicist at Caltech who was doing occult physics research. So it's not just Russia. Uh, happens here as well. But it's a lot, lot, nowhere near the degree that it was. And incidentally, it's nowhere near in Russia today what it was uh, back in the 1980s. It's different. In the back, then come to you. What, what's the difference between the brain and the mind? And what is virtual reality? Okay, did you all hear that question? <laughs> That's a loaded one. <laughs> What's the difference between the brain, the mind, and virtual reality? Okay, big debate today. If you go to my office at Reasons to Believe, you'll see I got 50 books basically on that question, almost all of them written by people who don't believe in God. And what they're trying to do is figure out what makes the human brain or human mind work, but they're trying to come up with an answer based simply on known physics and chemistry. And what's interesting about these books all of them end the book by saying, we haven't got a clue. They come up with suggestions. I mean, probably the most sophisticated ones would say, well, maybe human consciousness is buried in the quantum microtubules that are inside uh, these neurons. But they end the book by saying, well, that, that can't work either. So, and the real debate is, are we purely physical beings? Or are we physical and spiritual? And that was actually part of the debate I had with Peter Atkins, because he was promoting the idea we humans are 100% physical. I said, well, the Christian position is different. He said, yeah, I know it's different, that we are dualists. We have a physical nature, and we have a spiritual nature. And it's a spiritual nature that explains the mind. I mean, if you take away the spirit of a man, the brain basically doesn't do anything. If you want evidence for that, look at a human being who has just died, okay? The brain is largely intact, but it doesn't do anything. There's nothing to control it. Uh, the controller has left. And because the controller's left, all you've got is this physical computer-like machinery, and it's kind of like your computer. Your computer doesn't do anything unless you get behind the computer and begin to use it. Or software. Maybe. Or software. Well, <clears throat> uh, I should probably bring red pills to the class. So uh, that's, that's you know, some of you haven't even seen that movie. So <laughs> OK. Yeah, we'll bring red pills and blue pills next time for all of you to choose. OK. But uh, no, virtual reality is just simply trying to simulate reality just through software. And to point out your question, uh, it was the British physicist Roger Penrose has said, the interesting thing about the human mind, it's not just hardware. It's hardware and software. And it's not just hardware and software. There's a programmer. And this is where you really come in with a dualistic nature of humanity. It's the spirit within us that programs. Yes, there actually is some software that's in the brain there. Uh, but notice, it's really our spirit that develops software to make the hardware work. And the interesting thing is, there is no more powerful computer we humans have built than what's actually inside your head. They're still trying to come up with a computer uh, that actually has the computational capability of one human brain. So, yeah, John. I recall seeing a book about 50 years ago entitled Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, there was a lot of reporting about that. And also, the uh, 
what's been identified as the hard problem in science of explaining consciousness is resulting increasingly among researchers who say that they believe that consciousness is not an emergent property of the brain, it's something apart from the brain. They don't know what it is, but they're, they're concluding that it's not explained by the protoplasm. That's true. I mean, even committed atheists who study consciousness re admit that they can't yet come up with a physical explanation. They think they might if they keep studying it, but the whole point is they haven't come up with it yet. And uh, you know, even the consciousness of animals is something that's difficult to explain. As the Bible tells us, God made three different kinds of life. Life is purely physical. Life is physical and soulish, like the birds and mammals, and one and only one species that's physical, soulish, and spiritual. But yeah, I mean, our best non-theists even struggle trying to explain what goes on with birds and mammals. I mean, how do you explain emotions? Clearly, we have a level of consciousness far beyond that of even the smartest non-human animal. But even trying to explain that lower level of consciousness of a parrot a dog or a cat uh, has basically stymied the scientific community from a physical perspective. And I think this might actually lead to some kind of revival in the scientific community. What I'm seeing in the scientific community is a growing recognition that we humans really are distinct and exceptional. And the big breakthrough came in 2007 with a research paper that had the provocative title. It got past the uh, editors. Darwin's mistake. Basically saying Darwin made a big mistake in thinking we humans are simply an extension of the animals on this planet. He says, nope, all of our research tells us there is an enormous gulf between a human being and the smartest non-human animals. They said the biggest gulf is symbolic capability. The fact that uh, we come up with alphabets, we come up with number systems, we come up with equations. Uh, we communicate not just in a word or a sentence. We communicate in paragraphs and books. And uh, you know, this is what really enables us to be able to communicate and spread technology. This is what distinguishes us from the Neanderthals, for example. Neanderthals have been here a whole lot longer than we have, but what happened to them? Their technology did not develop. With humans, our technology exploded. They especially exploded once we got climate stability. Yes. Something that's always fascinated me is identical twins. I heard a story where um, uh, researchers asked these identical twins, the one was a hopeless alcoholic and the other one was a complete teetotaler. And um, I guess, I don't know, somehow they were <coughs> separately adopted out or something. The one said, well, my biological father was a hopeless alcoholic, so I'm a hopeless alcoholic. That's why I'm a, a hopeless alcoholic just because my father was. The other identical twin, who was a teetotaler, said, well, of course, I'm going to be a teetotaler because my father was a hopeless alcoholic. So the point is, is that even though they were identical twins, they did not have identical spirits. The one spirit chose to, no, I'm not going to go that way. Look what happened to my dad. The other one chose to. Yeah, that's my you know. Well, that's, you I mean, you're raising a good point, an excellent challenge to the idea that consciousness is purely physical. You would expect identical twins to have almost identical uh, conscious behavior, but they don't. I mean, that happens all the time with, uh, you know, identical twins. You can tell they're two very different people. It's the spirits. Yeah. That are different. The spirits are different. Yeah. And so, and it tells us in Psalms that it's God who bestows the Spirit upon each one of us. So, our mothers, we can thank them for our physical attributes, but God's the one that gives us the Spirit. Yeah, sorry, I missed you. Go ahead. In terms of previous subjects, what you mentioned, you talked about the occult. Didn't Sir Margaret have a long history and tradition of that problem up here for quite a long time? I know it would, I'm not fully from here to North, it was deeply into it. Yeah. Uh, before Dick Anderson came here in the 1950s and early 1960s, there was a lot of, they were actually holding seances here in the church. 
So yeah, that was going on. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's all true. A lot of activity is going on in the canyon. And, uh, you know, when this church basically left the, the liberal de li congregational denomination and decided to go independent, the first effort was to go up into the canyon where all this spiritual oppression existed and demonic activity and occult activity was going on. Uh, within the first year, they led 100 adults to Christ. And that was basically the beginning of the rebirth of this church. Yeah, if you want to know the history of this church, it was founded back in the 1880s, very conservative Bible-believing church. That was the case for decades. The church got built up to 500 adults, and then it got to be taken over by liberal theologians, and in its last days, by pe theologians that were deep into the occult. The membership dropped from 500 down to 12 adults. When it got down to 12, those 12 said, I think there's something wrong with the church. <laughs> and so it was those 12 uh, who uh, went over to Lake Avenue, because that was a growing congregational church. And they said, can you do a study on our church and tell us what we're doing wrong? What was interesting, Ray Ortland, who was a pastor at that time, said, we don't have to do a study. We already know what's wrong at Sierra Madre Congregational Church. Well, tell us. You guys let the Bible out. Oh, is that all it's going to take to turn things around, bring back the Bible? And they said, that would really help. <laughs> Moreover, why don't you interview this uh, young man that just joined our pastoral staff and see if you'd be interested in having him do a renewal work here at the, the church? And uh, Dick Anderson told me about that interview he had. So here were these 12 people, and uh, he said, I quickly discovered none of them were Christians. Uh, but I asked them if they were interested in the Christian faith. They asked me all kinds of questions. He said, during my interview as to whether or not they wanted to employ me, I led all 12 of them to Christ. Incidentally, some of those 12 were members of this class. Um, you know, they've uh, passed on since. Uh, but yeah, well, we had people here uh, 40 years ago that were part of that original 12. And uh, literally uh, within a year, the church was at over 100 people. And when I got involved here, it was running around about 350. So, uh, and incidentally, we hit a high water mark of 1,200 adults. And so we're, now we're trying to rebuild it to get it back up to that. I got one yes. More the last 10, 20 years, this, this transgender thing has been going. Right? People think in their head such a thing. But physically, there, there's been a history of, of hermaphrodites, people who are both gendered. Yes, extremely rare. Yeah, rare, but it still has happened. It so does. Because some of the stuff going on in their head be a genetic issue, not just a pure choice. Well, you know, I'm getting a little bit political here, but I'll, I'll stick my neck out anyway. <laughs> That's a big one sometimes. <laughs> Well, my whole, the reason why I'm not excited about uh, gays and lesbians coming into public schools and promoting their lifestyle or transgenders coming into the schools and promoting their lifestyle, children as they grow up inevitably struggle with gender identification. I mean, I could ask to a survey here. Uh, when you were between the age of two and 15, did you ever go through a period of uh, gender identity. I mean, I think that's common to everybody. <clears throat> what bothers me is these groups are coming to public schools and taking advantage of that and basically persuading these young children that they were born this way. Hey, the Bible tells us all of us struggle with sexual purity. All of us struggle with our sexual identity. This is normative to all human beings. It's part of the sin nature that's within us. And the Bible tells us we who are parents, those in authority, we need to be helping our children through these inevitable crises and not basically encouraging them uh, to give in. And incidentally, I think you look at the history. Uh, you can look at the Roman Empire or the Greek Empire. When it reached a point where they no longer uh, were concerned about sexual purity and the preservation of the families defined by one man and one woman, 
uh, giving birth to children and raising them to replicate uh, families, when that happened, those empires crumbled. It actually reached a point in the Roman Empire where 40% of the male population uh, was in the gay lifestyle. And it basically collapsed the Roman Empire. And the whole point is people think this is something that is neutral. It's not. But you get back to politics. This thing that's going on with the transgenders, couldn't there be some genetic not truth to it? I mean, could it be a legit, legitimate genetic problem they're having, not just a choice? Well, about one person in a billion is born with uh, at least some yeah, female well, and male, right. and that's one in a billion. What I'm hearing today is that one percent of the population is born transgender. Which I get that, that, but it's that one percent is a whole lot bigger than one in a billion. And so my thing is, yeah, I believe that everyone who has issues uh, with their gender identity, if you simply, in fact, we actually invited someone to speak at our AMP conference who came out of that, uh, was raised that way. He actually had uh, you know, two, uh, two mothers and uh, no dad. And his advice was very good. He says, whenever someone who's bisexual, homosexual, lesbian, transgender, identifies you as a Christian, says, okay, what do you think about my lifestyle? before you answer that question, what does the Bible say about this? Before you answer this question, say, I want to hear your story. Because every time you ask that question, you'll get a story of pain. Incidentally, I find that a good way when I talk to atheists. Okay, tell me your story. I mean, I wish I had more time with Peter Atkins to really explore, okay, what happened to you during your Anglican upbringing? Because it's obvious there's some painful experience there. And until you get people to actually talk about that, until you as a Christian can show some compassion <coughs> for what they've been through, uh, then it's difficult. Incidentally, uh, what this gentleman was saying, he actually pastors a church that's filled with people who come out of these uh, you know, bisexual, homosexual, and the lesbian backgrounds. And he says it's crucial that we accept them as people who've been created by God people who are in need of healing. And basically says, isn't that true of every human being? And isn't it true that every human being at some level struggles with maintaining sexual purity? That's a struggle we all face. And actually, you'll see this in the book of Corinthians. You know, our pastor right now is taking us through 1 Corinthians. He's just finished chapter four, we get into chapter five and six. You're gonna see Paul talking about some of the Corinthians who are now faithful followers of Christ in the church. And what does he say? He says, many of you were homosexual. Many of you were lesbian. But you came out of that. You were healed from that. And so basically the church is a hospital to help people get healed. But you can't heal them until you first find out their story. But the problem is a lot of these people think, you're a Christian, you're going to condemn me. You're going to tell me I'm a terrible sinner. No, first tell me, your story. I want to hear your story. Tell me about the pain that you've been through. And I will say this as a generalization. Every form of sexual impurity is symptomatic of some experience in their background of failed intimacy. All forms of sexual immorality stem from failed intimacy. And so when you ask people their story, tell me, where did you experience a failure in intimacy? Was it your mother? Was it your father? Was it a girlfriend? Was it a brother? Was it a teacher? You're going to find something. It's, it's always there. Matter of fact, I think that's true of all of us. All of us have experienced failures in intimacy. So, but uh, I know a guy, he's a friend of mine. He has a men's ministry. And what he does, he gets 12 to 15 men to spend a week together up in the wilderness of Montana. And what he does during that time is that he has every single man communicate their story of failed intimacy. He says, we all have a story, but most men keep it to themselves. And so this is an opportunity. And basically, he sets a ground rule. Whatever is expressed here stays here. It doesn't get out. But I want you to tell your deepest pain of lost intimacy or failed intimacy. 
don't give me a surface one. I want to hear the one that's pained you the most. And it's amazing the healing that takes place. But he says, it only works because I've got them for a whole week. It only works because we are not focusing on anything else. And also, it's a small group. But there's no reason why that can't happen uh, outside the wilderness of Montana. Yeah, John. Well, I know there's been several studies to determine whether this sexual diversity phenomenon is genetic, and they find that it's not genetic. That it's all based on learned behavior, and the, it apparently stems from the blurring of sex roles in the society, and there's a lack of a, a clear uh, sex role uh, and uh, also supportive uh, uh, factors to uh, encourage them uh, and um, also a lack of clear theory as to how the ideal produces uh, a, a strong personality formation <coughs> in a strong society, the, what's called the traditional home, and that um, it's, a, it's an excellent way to degrade the country is to attack that uh, aspect of society, to degrade the, uh, we, we have this horrible <coughs> divorce rate now, it's like 50%. The typical, as much as statistics report, <coughs> and uh, that the secret of a strong, enduring uh, society is to have a strong uh, uh, family relationship that's based on an indissoluble union and, uh, uh, and confidence in a, in a lifetime of, of shared experience. Well, I'll have to make a couple of comments on that. Number one, the paper that's cited most frequently to say that uh, these forms of a sexual behavior of genetic and a not behavior based. It's a paper that was written uh, by several homosexual men where they said they look at the chemistry of uh, practicing homosexual men and they said the chemistry is different than that of heterosexual men. Now, the failure of the study, they weren't able to show that that also shows up in boys who are not yet uh, sexually active. That was not in the paper. I mean, if they really want to make their case, they got to show that the chemistry is there from the time of birth. They didn't do that. The other thing they didn't do was to compare uh, homosexual men that are sexually active to those that are not sexually active or those that are a lot more sexually active than others. That was not part of the study either. But yeah, I'm of the persuasion now what's happening is the behavior is generating the chemical changes in the brain, not the genetics. And structural, by the way. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, what would have been good to follow the study, because the average homosexual man who is sexually active has over 100 partners a year. Okay? Let's compare what's happening in the chemistry of the brain of those individuals with those that are celibate and see what kind of difference you see. Then, of course, looking at the age differences. So, um, but that's where that whole thing is based. But, and a lot of you know, Focus on the Family organization was founded uh, right here in Arcadia. And I remember uh, when Jim Dobson founded Focus on the Family, he said, I believe that Satan's number one strategy is to destroy the traditional family. Because if he destroys the traditional family, he basically defeats the Christian worldview. So he says, we should expect that this is going to be uh, Satan's tool. And he says, look at it. It's been that way throughout world history. And therefore, if we really want to prevent the collapse of the American empire, we need to restore the family. Because look what happened in the Roman Empire when the family crumbled. So, um, and that organization is still going on there in Colorado now. So. Stay in the back. Um, I have a study by a person by the name of Bruce Bagnell, and he claims that he found uh, at least 450 species have uh, same sex behavior. Well, that's another paper has been cited where they say, hey, it's not just humans that engage in homosexual activity, non human animals do as well. Well, You'll see this, uh, I mean, God made animal life uh, to be sexual. And uh, fat farmers will tell you this. Uh, if the cows 
uh, don't have any bulls around uh, when they reach uh, you know sexual maturity you'll see them engaging uh, in what appears to be lesbian behavior but bring a bull in and that disappears so uh, the availability of partners makes a big difference and you see this in our, our prison system the prison system here in America is rife with homosexual and lesbian activity why because the availability of heterosexual partners is removed and just simply makes the point God created us as sexual beings and uh, we're not animals I mean uh, yeah we have a spirit nature that can control that but uh, a lot of people struggle with controlling that so uh, we shouldn't be surprised that we see these behaviors outside the human species and incidentally there actually are some species especially fish that can switch from one sex to the other they're biologically designed to do that and it's actually crucial for their survival because they're, they're, you know, the way the predators feed on them they often wind up with a huge surplus of females or a huge surplus of males but they actually have the biological machinery to be able to bring that into balance where for a lot of other species that almost never happens therefore there's no need uh, for that to happen so yeah be careful with people who cite these few instances uh, where we see that uh, outside of the human population. You know, government forms it says sexual preference sometimes, so even the government will admit that it's like a choice. Well, I'm getting a little concerned because next year I'm going to have to apply for a renewal of my passport, and I'm wondering whether or not I'm going to have 52 places to t indicate my <laughs> sexual identity. So, yes. Birth certificates now have three options. Birth certificates have three options. Okay. I won't ask what those three are. So hopefully two of them are male and female. So Well, I think we better get off the politics. Let's go back to Mars. Actually I'm out of time on Mars too, so uh, yeah, we've got about two minutes. We've got about two minutes. Anyway, uh, check out uh, the, the blog that I wrote on this. You can access it either through reasons.org or through my Facebook page. And uh, likewise, you can uh, get the debate that I had with Peter Atkins there. And uh, let me at least use my two minutes worth to get back to the book of Isaiah. <laughs> I got at least another minute and 20 seconds. These are the verses we're going through, and let me see if I can pick up where we left off. At least I can give you a homework assignment, right? Okay, this is where we left off. Uh, God is enthroned above the circle. Uh, uh, we covered that. I'm not going to go into it again. But look up and see who created these. He brings out the starry host by number. He calls them all by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. I think we covered all that. How God actually knows every star that exists out there. All 50 billion trillion of them. How he can uh, actually name 7 trillion stars after every human being and not run out. And if he knows the names of all those stars, chances are he knows your name. So let's see if we can pick up the passage we haven't covered yet. Isaiah 40, 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Yahweh, the Lord our Creator, is the everlasting God, the Creator of the whole earth. He never grows faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. Here's the homework assignment. How can you use this passage to... Get someone from deism to theism. Because a lot of people say, I believe in God. But this text is saying, it's not just deism. We're talking a God that's theistic. What's the difference between deism and theism? Deism, God creates the universe. Sets it all up, and then just lets it run by itself. Or another way of defining deism, it's a God who creates and takes a 14 billion year long nap. He's basically not involved in his creation. I think it's quite obvious this passage is saying 
something quite different. Uh, but I'm also going to ask you the question next week. Okay, it is saying something different. Can you explicitly identify what it is saying that is different? And what is your evidence that this passage is true? What evidence can you pull? In other words, if you run into a, a deist that says, okay, you threw this verse at me, prove it. How do you prove this verse is true? Okay, that's my minute and a half gone. Let me close in prayer. Father in heaven, we do live in a day and an age when uh, deism is becoming the favored worldview. Uh, and Lord, even people who call themselves agnostics, even those who call themselves atheists, we press the really deists. But Father, I pray that you would be equipping us to take these people who have this deistic worldview and be able to show them that reality, both in scripture and in the book of nature, tells us it's not deism, it's theism. There really is a personal God out there who cares for every component uh, of his creation through every, every moment of his creation, including every moment of our human lives for each of us as individuals. So Lord, equip us in that way and pray that you give us many opportunities to actually persuade those from a theistic worldview to adopt theism and Jesus Christ as our creator, Lord and savior. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, thank you.